Thank you very much to everyone for uh, inviting me and for joining us in this conference. My talk is called In Wildness is the Preservation of the World, and that's the conference hashtag for those of you tweeting and doing other social media kind of stuff. PABC 2015. So I'm inspired by a couple of things in this talk. Um, one is this uh, book co-written with Richard Reinhardt called Recollection, which the ideas are drawn from. And secondly, a digital curation program uh, that we started at the University of Maine, where I work, that's all online, and we have interns eager to work in your collection. So contact me after uh, the talk if you need help. I'm also inspired by, uh, in the sense of the talk is about wildness, uh, the native people that I've come to know in, um, in the northeast of the United States uh, and their sense of what it means to preserve things, which is very different from the sort of um, typical mainstream uh, Euro-American view of preservation, as you can tell from this quote. I also have to say, though, that there is a, um, even though we're all, most of us in this room, uh, colonial imperialists, there is a sort of spirit uh, that it was uh, part of Europe originally that I think had this wildness to it. And uh, it's embodied by this um, Thoreau quote in Wildness is the Preservation of the World from his text Walking of uh, 1862 that drives the, um, the title for my talk. Okay. So this is a conference on Born Digital. That's the title, right? Born Digital, Preservation and Access to Those Materials. Born Digital. A very evocative phrase, right? You see it a lot in our profession. Um, why is it born digital? Why not made digital, right? Are these things born? Uh, why not built digital? Well, I think that phrase is evocative in a number of ways that we might kind of dissect. For example, things that are born, the implication is they can also die. And as you'll find out through the course of this conference, there's a lot of different ways that digital material can die, right? It can die by technology obsolescence. It can die by institutional amnesia. It can die by laws that restrict access to it. But there's another, perhaps um, more subtle, implication of the word born. And I think that's that the idea that something that is born sort of evolves and develops organically, like this antelope, uh, in the wild in a sense that is different from something that has started out as something that was controlled. And we're not used to thinking of the wild as being on our side, right? Wilderness, nature, that's what we protect against as archivists, librarians, and curators, and conservators. We look at the chaos outside our borders. We might identify the wild with a sense of entropy, the legions of ruin that wait outside the white walls and the, and the vaults with which we protect our work. Um, but this is really to ignore basically everything that happened before human history, where petabytes of information stored inside the genetic archive of nature has survived for eons without any conservators to keep it going out there in the wild. So I'd like to step back and say, talk in three parts. First, to look at examples of this kind of preservation in the wild, metaphorically, by people who are far from the white walls of the institution. And you'll hear other people speak about these kinds of feral preservationists, but um, I'm going to spend a little time talking about in what sense they are wild. In the second part, uh, though, I'm going to look more literally at what it means to be preservation by the wild. That is, the kind of genetic archive represented by this antelope is something that is now a cutting edge in digital preservation. Since, 19, since 2012, scientists have been encoding documents, images, books in DNA as a preservation mechanism. This was mentioned in one of the workshops yesterday, but I think that uh, most people aren't really too familiar with this particular uh, edge of research. And in looking at some of the ways in which these new organic archives help us preserve digital culture, I'm going to sort of ask whether the pitfalls of software and hardware that you're going to learn about in the next couple of days might be solved by transitioning to wetware. And then in the third part, I'm going to ask whether the lessons from studying that genetic archive might be applied to help us work with preservationists who are in the wild and enlist them to help us uh, access outdated and, and obsolete software and, and digital culture in general. So, Let's get started. Um, first off, one of my favorite examples of preservation in the wild is the Mapinguere. Mapinguere is a giant beast in the legends of the Amazon uh, natives. Uh, 20 feet tall, wrapped in a bony carapace, uh, 
smelling of a sort of horrible smell, that's what the word Nepingure means. Almost every tribe of the Amazon basin, basin has a name for this animal, and not only name for it, but stories of, of what it was like to encounter it. Um, and what's interesting about this, uh, this story is that when uh, an anthropologist who had heard about the description, no one's ever seen these creature and photographed it in the New York Times, it just lives in, in, these, in these kind of stories that these tribes have of it. Um, the, one of, the, uh, one of the, the anthropologists who was studying um, these people uh, found out that there was a account of the actual creature, at least in a, a dead form, bones, um, because um, one of the um, natives said, well, I've, I've seen a Mapingure recently in a museum in Lima, in Peru. He said, oh, wow, wow, what kind of museum is it? What's well, a natural history museum, and they have a, they have a model of it. So the anthropologist Glenn Shepard went there and saw this. The Megatherium, the giant brown sloth of South America. And the only thing that's really odd about this is that the giant ground sloth died out tens of thousands of years ago. So the story of the Mapingure is over 10,000 years old and has only been passed on orally. There's no documents, there's no written or you know, fixed material that this history is recorded in. It's simply a wild preservation, a, uh, a series of legends passed down from one generation, hundreds of generations, uh, depicting this particular creature. Um, so we're talking about, when we think about the oldest human record, we might think of stony tablets, like you know, this, uh, this Phaistos disc from Crete, you know, which is about 3,500 years old and written in linear A. But we really can go back further and say stories like the Mapinguere are at least 10,000 years old and probably longer because if you think about it, the stories probably uh, existed long before the creature went extinct, right? Possibly back ice ages and further. So as a human record, that's an extraordinary uh, milestone. We might also ask ourselves, oh, okay, so, so, so to begin this sort of first part, I'm gonna ask, what about this preservation in the wild? What can we learn from it? How, how does it work? Um, so in, there are many other examples of, of, of native stories uh, turning out to bear uh, information that we can use today or that's factually accurate. Uh, most recently in, in Melbourne, a few years ago, uh, there were aboriginal stories about these islands that used to exist in the, um, in the oceans and everyone thought that they were just fables. Um, but because they were very accurate, uh, Aboriginal uh, dreamlines have very precise geometric or geological kind of um, coordinates that can be assessed and explored. And divers who looked for these actually found these hidden islands. They were sunk uh, because of changes since the Ice Age. But now that the sea levels are starting to recede, they can be visible again. And they could be pinpointed, not quite with Google Maps type accuracy, but with a pretty fair accuracy geologically thanks to these stories. Then you have cases of not necessarily preservation in the wild, but wild preservationists, and there are people who are not part of an institution. A classic example is the BBC losing all the Doctor Who episodes from a particular episode, uh, a period of history, didn't necessarily lose them. In some cases, they deliberately said, oh, we don't have storage. No one will be interested in Doctor Who episodes. Who would, who would think that? Uh, so they threw them out, basically. But these people, uh, ordinary British and, 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 and other viewers uh, on the television, recorded them, and in some cases only had the audio. Um, and, you know, in other cases, just literally recording with a video camera from the television. And they reconstituted this into archive based entirely on amateur footage. So again, th those are not official people. Those are amateurs, uh, people in the wild helping to preserve culture. One thing I think is interesting about these examples is context, because it's one of the hardest things to preserve about culture, right? You pull a, a, an Elgin marble out of the Parthenon and you stick it in, in, in the British Museum and suddenly you have to explain everything about it. Well, it was on this hill and it had this pediment and it had these other sculptures nearby because you've ripped it out of its context. Well, an interesting thing about this sort of wild culture is I think it brings context along with it. So for example, in the case of the Megatherium, the native stories tell us that it smelled bad, that it, it moved through the forest without making a sound, that it, that it avoided water, right? Uh, none of that we could guess from the bones. I mean, it'd be very uh, uh, tentative uh, sort of um, scientific research to say, well, we, we know that it smelled bad or we know that it avoided water. Uh, but the stories um, have brought along some sense of, of what it was like to actually encounter that creature. Domesticated culture, on the other hand, 
not so good with context. Okay, I'll give the example of the Phaistos disk, linear A. Linear A is everyone who talks about, you know, stony artifacts preserving culture. They always talk about the Rosetta Stone. Rosetta Stone is a rare example of a really successful uh, piece of preservation because it makes a crosswalk and we can understand you know, hieroglyphics because it's got Demotic Greek on it. But we still don't understand Linear A. Linear A is this, just this, you know, language that was encoded in these, these stony disks that, uh, that we have no reference point for. We, we have very little idea what these things said because they lost their context along the way. And I would argue digital culture, the way we're preserving it now, the way that the typical person thinks, oh, I've got an archive, I've saved my stuff, I've stored it, is like linear A, more than it is like the Lepinguere. Because linear A can't be read even though we have all the symbols. It's like we've got the file, we've got a fixity check, boom, it's set. But we don't know the context. In essence, we can't run it the way we'd run a piece of software. And I can save a file on a disk and have it perfectly checked. Oh, the checksums all work out. I've migrated it from one medium to another. I've got all the ones and zeros. They haven't changed. But if I don't have the context, the software, the operating system, the display, the sound, the other peripherals, I can't read it. Storage is not a long-term preservation strategy. We need more, we need other ways to think about bringing the context. And I'm excited by the fact that wild preservation does that. Now, one thing you'll hear a lot about this weekend is uh, emulators. Emulators are really exciting for a lot of reasons. And one reason I think is that they, and to some extent, bring the context along with them. Because when you emulate a file, you don't just get the file, you also get you know, the browser it ran on, the operating system that that ran on, and then a whole sort of um, experiential uh, environment that comes along with the file as it's running. Uh, at the Guggenheim, um, where I was curator, we did a show called Seeing Double, where we tested emulators by running them next to each other. So we had the original software, original hardware, running in these ancient machines, and right next to it, a piece that was emulated in a newer software, but running the original code. Um, the centerpiece of the show is a piece called The Earl King, one of the first interactive video installations from 1982 or thereabouts, and we put the pieces side by side. And they were so successful, the one uh, running a ancient Sony computer from 1982, three analog laser disc players, 104 cables, a CRT screen, and a, a custom touch screen. And then on the other side, a single Linux box running the same code with just a, a quick Java uh, emulator, and then a, um, a, a flat screen embedded to look like it was a CRT. The piece was so successful that the audience members we surveyed, because we did a study about this, said, we don't know why you put two pieces of the same piece in the gallery. Why'd you do duplicate it? It doesn't make sense. So we had to actually cut a hole in the kiosk to show that the guts of the two were different um, and, and explain that, yeah, this is actually a test to see, is the spirit the same? Now, um, the experiments like Seeing Double were so successful that the Library of Congress, no eager beaver when it comes to you know, the latest uh, kind of crazy technology, um, wrote a report in 2013 after a conference that some folks were at here, in which they said, emulation may serve our needs better than hardware. So they're actually uh, coming out and saying, we, we kind of see the, the advantage of this way you have of, of actually changing out the hardware, but keeping the spirit alive. But emulation by professionals doesn't have a really long history. Okay, so in the context of art, um, seeing double was 20, 2004. Um, there have been some, um, some projects since then, including preserving virtual worlds, uh, which focused mostly on, on games and emulating games. Um, but, you know, we're, we're basically 10 years uh, into this. Preserving emulation uh, via emulation by amateurs, 1974 or so it started, right? And of course, they're not emulating the great works of the Western canon, they're emulating video games, because they want to. They're excited by it. We often call these people hobbyists or amateurs, but I think amateur is kind of a, a, a in English, the wrong expression. It's a little better in French. Um, let's just look at, well, maybe that's the past. Um, what's going on now? Well. If, uh, this was a study uh, last year by Jens Martin Lobel uh, about how often emulators are cited, not in the worlds of gaming forums and you know, crazy people who are out there you know, in their underwear and bedrooms coding emulators, but actually by academic researchers. And as you can see, <laughs> amateurs, hobbyists, still make up the vast majority. And then there's a couple commercial ones, and researchers, actual people in like universities and like museums, 
tiny, tiny sliver so far. So they're kicking our butts, right? They're out there making these um, software applications that preserve, uh, preserve culture, and we're trying to catch up. And again, I think this word amateur is a little misleading, unless you think of it in the French, amateur, someone who loves something and is really passionate. Because many of these so-called amateurs are really experts. They're both amateur and expert. Amateurs just in the sense they're not professionals. They're not necessarily paid to do it. So here's an example of a Nintendo uh, emulator called FCEUX. And it started out with something called FCE, stands for Family Computer Emulator, that was what it was called in Japan. And it had a couple of features, it was open source, it ran with one platform, DOS. And the, the guy who wrote it actually said, admitted, this is, my code's dirty, it's a mess, anyone who wants to take it, take it. Well, uh, it was then developed in a series of forks, meaning that people branched the code and started working on projects independently over the next uh, 10 years, and finally reconverged into an emulator with all of these amazing features. Now, I can't think of a single example of preservation software made by the professional community, museums, archives, libraries, that did that, where, where they kind of passed the software back and forth supply uh, and flexibly and openly between themselves, uh, working on separate institutions and then sort of you know, re-emerging with this very converged super feature set uh, at the end of the project. And yet, you know, this is not people who are paid. We don't even know most of the time who these people are. They just contribute to forums. But, you know, it's diverging, reconverging, it's constantly improving, and there's nobody in charge. It's in the wild. Where do we find these people? We want to use them. You know, we want to, want to get to them because, wow, they're, they're doing this job that we want to do, and maybe they can help us. Well, um, they're found in the long tail. And the long tail is a concept from, you know, Chris Anderson of, of Wired, of, of how the internet is different from regular television broadcast media. We had to appeal to sort of, you know, the lowest common divisor, like what everyone liked. In the long tail, you can find people who are absolutely obsessed about particular kinds of coffee or particular kinds of video games. And, and, and they're not just like, oh, I'm happy with the way this video game ran because I can more or less run it. They're, they're obsessed about the pixel level details and the exact pacing and so forth. Uh, and uh, in addition to, you know, the kind of uh, emulator writers, you have people who are wild programmers who are doing things that are equally impressive in other spheres. Uh, this is the ISEE uh, uh, Comet Explorer. It was sent out in 1978 by the European Space Agency and NASA to explore comets. And it went out and it did its thing and it came back. It came back a few years ago. Um, but it didn't have a hero's welcome because we couldn't contact it. The software was... 30 years old, and no one knew how to access it. NASA tried, you know, they have some of the best engineers in the world, and they were unsuccessful. But a, a comic artist, a guy named uh, Randall Monroe, who, who has the famous um, sort of XKCD comic, some of you may know, that appeals to geeks, uh, put out a call, and he said, wouldn't it be cool if all those amateur astronomers out there were actually able to find a way to hook up with this errant spacecraft and sort of bring it back into, into action, you know, kind of re-energize it, reconnect with it. And that's exactly what happened. One of the most astounding tweets I've ever seen. We are now in command of the ISE spacecraft. Um, also kind of scary, right? Things in the wild are scary, like what the hell else can these hackers, you know, kind of get command of? Um, but they, you know, they fired some thrusters and they, they, they did this thing. And, 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 and frankly, you know, whenever I see the story, I always think, wow, you know, uh, I was... These are, these are people who, who reached out over millions of miles of empty space. They, they crowdfunded time on dish antennas around the world. Not an easy thing to do. Uh, they reignited this software protocol from 1978 and managed to control the spacecraft. I mean, suddenly, you know, compared to these sort of space Samaritans, uh, you know, getting a piece of flash to run on an old computer doesn't sound so bad. Right? Uh, so, so these people are incredibly skilled, many of them. Um, but we, it's not just scientists, there's also wild artists. And by wild, I don't mean just like, oh, artists are wild, they're crazy. No, I mean like wild, like they do it without anyone asking them to. So this is a computer magazine from the 70s, late 70s, only ran for like a couple of years, uh, computer graphics and art. And a bunch of contemporary uh, uh, artists got together in an open source way and said, yeah, it would be cool if we could recreate those. But those images, even though they were created on, on these ancient computers, there was no code, there was no contact with the artists, no one asked permission, no one gave them any source material. It was only what, was, what they saw depicted 
moved in the magazine. And what they did is they said, hey, you know, we could probably, we could probably recreate those in processing or you know, JavaScript or whatever. So they actually went ahead and built versions in contemporary languages with no access to the original code of the images that were in there and tried to make them as identical as possible. No one paid them to do this. There was no exhibition. There was no you know, publication. It was just a bunch of people online saying, hey, cool, I bet I could do that. And if you go to the Recode project, you can see these, these, you know, they sort of put out a bid, like, can anyone do this? Oh, I did that. Oh, can anyone do this one? Oh, I could do that. Completely kind of volunteerism, recreating digital culture. Um, visitors to our exhibitions can be wild, too. Let's see if I can get into the internet here. OK. So yeah, there we go. All right, so um, I was at a museum in, in Mexico City recently uh, with some of the folks who will be at, uh, presenting at this conference, and I decided eh, it would be fun to, to scan some of the objects in the museum. This is a puma, an Aztec puma. Um, so that means that uh, it's a, a, a piece um, uh, that uh, I just had a phone with me and I wanted to scan and take pictures of it, so I did. Uh, that's again something that people can do in these contexts um, of, of feral preservation. Uh, so very quickly, I'm gonna go through this part two preservation uh, by the wild. Uh, and this is a different situation. This is one in which we're talking about uh, organic life forms um, preserving, uh, preserving uh, of digital culture, because in essence, we're all born digital. Suzanne Pry, a famous um, librarian, French librarian, said, oh, an antelope can't be an archive. I claim that it can. Um, we have people who, like Pilar Bosch, who are actually breeding uh, bacteria to conserve frescoes, but that's sort of just using life uh, in, in a conventional uh, a way. I'm actually going to think about the more advanced aspects of organic computing. I don't have time to go through all these now, but it's kind of crazy how much things scientists have done in the last um, five, well, the last three years or so, uh, including um, storing data in DNA, um, creating a mixture of DNA that reads digital, digital image, images. Um, the claims for the organic archive are pretty extreme. In one gram of DNA that would fit on your thumbnail, there's 700 terabytes of data. That's 14,000 Blu-ray discs. It's also extremely stable. DNA can survive for hundreds of thousands of years in a box in your garage. At least that's what they claim. So you can imagine sort of Coca-Cola dispensers that would have the Library of Congress in them. Anytime you need it, you just bring out a bottle. Um, how does it work? Well, basically, you encode the stuff in DNA, and then you replicate it so you get a bunch of copies. And um, here's a little diagram I'll show briefly. So you take Shakespeare's to be or not to be, you translate that into ones and zeros. Now we know this, we, we do this all the time, right? That's how we get uh, computer programs that, you know, at Gut Project Gutenberg, whatever, we can read Shakespeare. But this part we're not so familiar with, whoops, I'm sorry, um, where we take um, that, those ones and zeros and we translate them into genetic code. So in DNA, there's two sort of, um, a series of nucleotides, won't go into the details, but basically there are two kinds of pairs, uh, adenosine thymine and adenine thymine and cytosine guanine, and you can correspond each of those pairs with a particular one or a zero, and then you just make a mapping like that. And then when you're done, you end up with basically encoding that into DNA, because each of those is the base pairs for this twisted helix thing, and now you have a, a, a strip of, of chromosomal material that has Shakespeare in it. And um, how do you replicate that? Well, there's actually a machine uh, that um, basically raises the heat of DNA that unzips and uh, all the floating nucleotides that match up with it reconnect and it kind of creates two strands from that. And then you cool it back down and it makes it back into DNA. Again, without going into the details, it basically allows you to make millions and millions of copies very quickly of the DNA. So. Um, I don't think this is the future, at least not exclusively. Some people are like, wow, you forget, throw out the floppy disk, throw out you know, hard drives, throw out the cloud. It's all gonna be wetware. Here are the problems I see. Evolution, uh, DNA is built by evolution for evolution. That's its purpose. So it creates genetic drift, ultraviolet rays create mutations, and PCR, the, the thermal process I just mentioned, generates errors. Everybody knows that. 
So the researchers are like, no problem. We're going to encapsulate the DNA in tiny glass spheres. We're going to hide it in the Svalbard seed vault, this, this, this vault in Norway where, in, in theory, you know, all these seeds are going to be saved for the future. Not only that, we're going to fix it with this sort of organic checksums, right? Uh, this thing called Reed-Solomon codes. It's going to make sure that those errors get fixed. Um, I don't have a lot of faith in that, uh, those particular solutions. They're trying to domesticate uh, uh, the wild. In particular, this Svalbard seed vault, um, you actually can't save seeds indefinitely, even if they're in some frozen wasteland in, the, in a vault in, in, in the Arctic. You actually have to pull them out and regrow them every few years because that's how seeds work. Seeds are not designed to be in the ground, you know, left frozen forever. They're designed to be preserved in the medium of the wild. So, um, I don't think storage is preservation. That's another problem. This is the seed vault. Or, uh, that's great. You're putting those things in there, and you would with you, you would store things in genetic archives. But ultimately, you have the same problem as as the rest of our digital material in this linear A. You're not bringing anything but the file. You don't have any sense of how it's to be interpreted or its context. Um, and there's other failures of domesticating wildness that we know on. And, and I think the lesson there is we need to respect the ecosystem. So um, cultivating the ecosystem is something that a number of other projects have done where instead of making a museum, they actually try gardening and putting the things in the ground and actually having them um, grow as part of a natural history museum. Well, finally, quickly, I'll, I'll talk about suggestions for ways to work with the wild. Working with feral programmers, the, believe it or not, a government agency in the United States has started uh, putting out uh, bounties for, for open source programmers to solve small problems. Amazing that an institution as big as the US government can do that. In the case of the Andy Warhol recently discovered um, digital uh, art, uh, the, the, the disks on which it was um, found were unreadable. But um, local, uh, the, the, the Andy Warhol Foundation was able to work with uh, the local computer club and enlist um, very smart uh, computer programmer students to uh, use forensics to discover the, the basis of those images. Um, you can have people who are visitors scan objects in the collection, bring them home, 3D print them. And that's, uh, that's something that, for example, the San Francisco Museum of, of Asian Art has done as a way to encourage people to interact with and preserve the collection. Uh, Photosynth is an amazing project I don't have time to show, whereby using photographs uh, acquired just from Flickr, um, you can recreate a 3D, um, infinitely sort of zoomable model of Notre Dame. And um, reprogrammed art is an example of where um, older artists, uh, uh, an Italian group called Gruppo T from the 60s, is working with younger artists who are recreating their works in newer technologies like Arduino. And finally, the Variable Media Questionnaire offers a way for anyone really to register their opinions about how work should be preserved, allowing the artist to be as wild as they want in terms of their intention, even though as a museum, you want eventually to be able to display it in the future. So I hope I've given you some sense of the value I see in the wild. Um, you can get to this talk at the bottom there via the link johnapolito.net slash presentations. Or if you prefer, you can come up and I can inject it into your arm. Thank you very much.